stunning statistics is that there are more tigers in captivity in the US than there now are in the wild. A situation where under the USDA regulations, the cage only needs to be big enough for the animal to stand up and turn around in. So you can only imagine the small cages that people build that are actually legal and, and you know, could potentially be in our backyards right now. Tiger crisis, um, it, it, it didn't get to this point if everybody was aware that, you know, tigers need to be protected and tigers, wild tigers belong in Asia, in the wild, in their natural forest. When you see the kinds of places that these animals live, you, you start to realize that in some cases it's a, a fate worse than death. Hi. I'm Kristen Bauer for the Animal Legal Defense Fund. My character, the vampire Pam on True Blood, fends for herself just fine in her unlikely Louisiana home. But for one wild animal in particular, Louisiana is the last place on earth he belongs. Tony is a Siberian Bengal tiger who has been living on display as a tourist attraction at a truck stop outside Baton Rouge since 2001. In the wild, Tony might roam a territory of 100 square miles, but for the last decade, he has instead lived in a concrete enclosure plagued by the noise of diesel engines and the stench of gasoline. Years of living in isolation and confinement have taken their toll on Tony's health. Day after day, this magnificent cat is taunted and harassed by tourists. Instead of basking in the sun and hunting by night, Tony paces his cage, a sign of extreme psychological distress. Confining a wild animal as a roadside spectacle is wrong. Join me and the Animal Legal Defense Fund in urging the state of Louisiana to revoke the permit that allows Tony to be kept at the Tiger Truck Stop a permit that violates a state law designed to protect people and big cats like Tony. Help us win the fight for his freedom. Visit aldf.org slash Tony. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Educational Forum. I'm your host, Diane Sullivan. I have been an animal advocate and a lawyer for many years, but I have to admit that I did not know about the plight of tigers living in the United States until a former student, Rose Church, called me, explained the problem, and asked for my help. What I found out is that there are two issues. The first issue contributing to the tiger problem is what they call pay to play. Carol Baskin, the founder and the CEO of Big Cat Rescue, explains what pay to play is and its impact on tigers. We track all of the killings, maulings, and escapes by big cats on our website at bigcatrescue.org. And what was happening was there were so many people that were being mauled while they were paying to pet tigers or have their pictures made with tigers that USDA created a, uh, a requirement that you could not touch a big cat, a lion, tiger, or leopard, after it reached the age of 12 weeks because they became too dangerous. Because they're wild animals. <laughs> they're tigers. <laughs> right, okay. In the case of Haley Hildebrand, she was a 17-year-old girl. It was very common in her area where she lived in Kansas to have your picture made with a tiger for your yearbook. And so like all these other kids had done, she went to this facility, had her picture made with a 600-pound tiger who killed her during the photo shoot. As a result, there was a huge outcry for a bill called Haley's Act that would end the contact with these animals. USDA had already said that you couldn't touch them after the age of 12 weeks. USDA came back and said you can't touch the cub up until the age of eight weeks. And the reason for that is the cub doesn't have sufficient immune, uh, immune system to be able to deal with all of that handling. So what that did was it created an eight to 12 week window, a one month window, in which people can still pay to touch these tigers. And as long as people will pay to touch these tigers, breeders and dealers will breed excessively to meet that demand. It really comes back to the public. If you could just stop the public from doing this, that it would save so many lives. So let me make sure I have this straight. I could go to perhaps a mall, 
pay twenty dollars or maybe seventy five dollars have my twenty twenty okay have my picture taken with a tiger cub who is between the ages of eight weeks and twelve weeks and then then I would leave with this cute little picture and the memory now if somebody is making money out of this, which I'm assuming they must be, otherwise why would we have this going on, they would have to be breeding, it would seem to me, a tremendous amount of tigers each and every year to ensure that they have cubs open between the ages of 8 and 12 weeks. Am I right about this? That's correct. Do you have any idea of how big a business this is? We know that one vendor said that he could make over $20,000 in a single weekend at the mall. I know another person that breeds these animals who I had gotten a copy of an email that he had sent around mm -hmm. saying he needed 200 cubs per year just to be able to have all of his photo booths stocked. These photo booths are just, they travel around to malls, they put the cubs down on the floor in a cage, you go in, you have your picture made with the cub, and these cubs are being just constantly awakened and handled by the public. These are cubs that would spend two years or more with their mothers. So the mothers are being just bred to death to be able to provide these cubs for this purpose. And it's a horrible life for both the mother and for the cub. As you can imagine, being jostled awake, every time you try to finally drift off to sleep, these guys need a lot of sleep as cubs. And yet they're, every time somebody comes up with 10 or $20 to have their picture made, they're jerking that cub up and making the picture with them. So if there is only this one month window of opportunity to have your picture taken with a tiger cub, what happens to the tiger cub when it's 13 weeks old or maybe even a year old or particularly when it's full grown because we all know that a tiger cub grows into a tiger and they really are not suitable house pets? What happens to them? Unfortunately, we don't know in many cases where these animals end up. The ones we do know about always end up in horrible situations where they end up needing to be rescued because like you said, somebody will take this animal in as a pet and think, well, it was used for these photo ops and it's handleable yeah. and so it's gonna be this great pet and then it gets to be a year, year and a half and they're like 200 pounds by then and the people are scared to death of them and they can't find a place fast enough to unload their animal. Tell me how they live at your sanctuary. What's life like for a tiger there? I've seen some delightful pictures of tigers actually even painting to amuse themselves. The biggest challenge that we face is trying to meet the emotional needs of these cats. Mm -hmm. You're talking about cats that in the wild would roam 400 square miles of territory. That would be their home base. So there's no cage that's going to be giving them a sufficient life. We do an awful lot of the stuff like you're talking about, giving them pumpkins and uh, watermelons and pools and a lot of interaction. We don't do any hands-on interaction with the cats, but just talking to them and um, trying to make their lives as, as pleasant and as peaceful as possible. The bigger issue is that we need to end the abuse at its start because there aren't enough sanctuaries, and even if they are, they, there were, these cats just don't belong in cages. The biggest leading cause for so many of these animals to end up in these horrific situations are that people will pay to have their picture made with a cute little tiger cub. And you can imagine how, how much people want to do that. They're so cute. and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm they will always justify it by saying, well, it's just this one time. And even though people always seem to know that there's something inherently wrong about that whole situation, about why am I able to touch this cub? Where's the cub's mother? They still manage to justify it by saying, this one time won't make a difference. This is something I want to do. This is something I want to give as a gift. And the result is that the people that breed these animals will constantly be breeding more and more cubs to supply that demand. If the public would stop, then the breeding would stop and it, this whole thing would just die out over time. The other major issue facing tigers in the United States is that there are no federal regulations prohibiting people who want to keep tigers as pets. Pet ownership is a matter of state law, and some states do not regulate the keeping of tigers or other exotic animals. Today, 21 states allow private citizens to keep a tiger as a pet, 
with as little a requirement as a license or a permit, and some do not even require that. Yeah, that's correct. And with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because there's no permitting requirement, there's no tracking system. So we really don't have a sense of how many of these backyard tigers there are out there. So people can buy these tigers on Craigslist or Facebook. And, you know, with no training at all, you basically can keep them like you would a domestic cat. The problem is after about six months old, they become a huge tiger. And then they basically become confined to a small cage, you know, living in somebody's backyard or in the basement or, you know, in a situation of an apartment building. And, you know, it basically outs the actual homeowner from whatever living quarters they're in. Did you ever envision yourself as going to the pet store or the, the barn down the street or Craigslist and getting a tiger? No, not at all. I mean, and to me, the whole concept is just completely inconceivable. It just, when I heard about this situation and how prevalent it is in the United States, I was just in shock. And I think it took me probably three or four days to really come to the realization that this is a real issue and something that's really happening. Describe some of the backyard scenes that tigers are kept in. Well, the, the ones that I've seen, which have been mainly from rescue centers, where they actually have gone and rescued these backyard tigers, they, they basically live in deplorable conditions. They're basically in just flat concrete cells that are, you know, no bigger than the size of a parking space. And it's completely legal under the regulations as they are right now. Um, and it's, it's really sad because the tigers actually pace, which is something that they shouldn't naturally be doing. Um, and they're not given any kind, type of natural habitat. So they're basically out there you know, in the wild, in, in a concrete, not out in the wild as they should be, pacing back and forth with um, basically nothing to do. And they're given probably not even enough meat that they were supposed to have. Why did you get involved with trying to help put an end to the problems surrounding the life of tigers in the United States? Well, I first got involved working for a nonprofit, which was one of my pro bono projects. Um, and we were really looking at the Tony the Tiger situation down Louisiana. And when doing research for that, I realized that, you know, Tony was just one of maybe 15,000 tigers living in the United States. And that really there was a serious problem with the laws and the regulations. And, you know, as an attorney, I felt like it was kind of my duty to, to step in and try to solve the problem in whatever capacity I could. While doing research on the tiger problem, we spoke with individuals from a few of the animal welfare organizations about their thoughts on the tiger problem. Adam Roberts is the executive vice president of Born Free USA. Adam has significant expertise in international wildlife trade and captive wild animals, and he serves on several committees, including animals in captivity. Born for USA is a national animal advocacy and wildlife conservation organization, and we have offices in California and D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, we also operate a primate sanctuary down in Texas. And our basic philosophy, much like our partners in the U.K. at Born Free Foundation, is to keep wildlife in the wild. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple message, so that we're um, against the keeping of animals in captivity, provided that it's not humane captivity. It's kind of complicated because, of course, when we have a sanctuary for primates, that's captivity, but we try and give them as naturalistic an environment as possible so that they can live out the remainder of their days in peace with limited human interference in a natural surrounding, juxtaposed against treatment of animals in circuses or when they're caught for their fur or when they're killed in the wild for their parts. I want to talk a little bit about zoos and circuses and your position on that and ask you whether animals can really be kept humanely and safely in those conditions. Well, I think under certain circ circumstances you might be able to. I mean, the